Sense Radio. Today's date is February 25th. Right? 6th. Oh, 26th. Okay. So, the site I'm looking at called HeyJackass.com. <laughs> The site was last updated on the 25th, so there might be more people dead in Chicago uh, that I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, but so let's see, 26 days and then 30 days, or 31 days, January, right? 31 mm-hmm. yep. plus 26. What's that? 57? Mm, yeah. That hurts. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds right. Uh, 57 days. We've gone in 2018, shot and killed in Chicago, 66 people. Wow. Mm. That's a massacre, it's right? Fine. It is. Just letting you know. Just think about it. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, really privileged to have Ed Dowd on the show with me this morning. Ed Dowd, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jamie. It's good to be here. Uh, good to talk to you again. I uh, really had the privilege of covering Ed Dowd when he was U.S. attorney here in St. Louis for a, a long time when I was over Channel 4. And so I've known Ed for a long time, a good guy, and now is representing Governor Eric Greitens in the wake of that indictment. Now, Mr. Dowd has been uh, fiercely uh, defensive of Governor Greitens, especially considering the process, the indictment process, which uh, Ed Dowd, you say, is highly unusual, correct? Uh, to me, it really is. In what I way? Have, uh, you know, I've been doing this a long time now, uh, both representing the public and uh, private litigants, and um, I've never seen anything like this at all. I consider it very unusual. Because you say the law itself has never been uh, applied this way, correct? Like this is this invasion of privacy. In what way? Well, the statute is a what's called a peeping tom statute, and it's, and it's you know it's aimed at people who sneak up to somebody's house and peer in the window and watch you in your bedroom or your living room, uh, where you have a right to expect privacy. Um, this situation is the opposite of that. There are two consenting adults three years ago. I mean, this is a three-year-old thing where nothing happened. Two consenting adults, and um, and she could not possibly have had any expectation of privacy because the, the statute defines it as that that person has to be in a place where they have a reasonable expectation of privacy where they don't expect to be viewed while naked or partially naked. In this case... She totally knew she was naked and going to be viewed. So the statute is just defied by the conduct itself. It's not not illegal. It's not a crime. Grand jury proceedings are secret. So you don't know, and even if you did, you wouldn't really be able to talk about the grand jury process. You can talk about the process, but not the people who appeared there. Is it possible that when they list the witnesses, and she's listed as a witness, that is it still possible that she actually didn't personally testify uh, or if she did, she could have pleaded the fifth, and that, uh, and that the, the the piece of evidence they are utilizing to uh, further the indictment is actually her tape. That would be amazing to me, uh, and, and would really surprise me in every respect. I, I I'm, would just be amazed if they didn't force her to go into the grand jury. She was. You know, her lawyer and she made a comment, God, I guess six weeks or two months ago, public statement, the only public statement she's made, which was she wanted her privacy respected. She didn't want to be involved in this. She just wanted it to go away so she could go along with her life. She never complained to the police department. It's another one of the strange things here. Usually you you have a complaining witness go to the police department and say, this is what happened. You know, there's been a crime committed. In this case, she never contacted anyone. Her estranged, her former husband, I should say, her former husband was complaining in the press to her lawyer, to his lawyer, and and uh, the the circuit attorney picked it up and, and ran with it without any complaint, and then didn't even use the St. Louis Police Department to investigate it, hired private investigators, which is also extremely unusual. I've never, ever heard of that before. He didn't go to the police either, correct? The, the, the husband, the ex-husband? No, I don't believe so. Okay. I think it was just all in the, 
I mean, they claim they went to the FBI. I have no idea if that's true or not. The FBI is not interested in this in any way, and neither is the U.S. Attorney, I can assure you. Um, when this first became public, I said, I can't imagine any prosecutor wanting to get involved in a three-year-old tryst between consenting adults, particularly somebody who's, who's trying to run the state. Back to exactly back back to the hiring of private investigators. Now, as I mentioned last week, and, and I'm I don't, I'm not wrong about this. The circuit attorney's office itself has its own investigators, correct? Yes, they do. And to your knowledge, the circuit attorney didn't use those investigators, right? No, it's our understanding that they used uh, investigators, private investigators, and not even law enforcement people uh, in Kansas City. Well, I, I know for a fact that there are some private investigators who have contacted people I know uh, who are looking into this as well. And so, uh, from a, from a standpoint of of a of a of a court case, and and I realize that you're kind of you're in a, you know, obviously there are certain rules that apply to people who are in uh, in the bar, and that you can't be personally critical, obviously, of Kim Gardner. I get all that, right. uh, but 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 the other situation though is is this. Uh, is is that not to, uh, hiring private investigators? I mean, is that I don't know whether it, legal, ethical, proper. I mean, and and could a case actually implode based on that? I I really don't know because I've never seen it before. Um, I would be shocked if they didn't somehow deputize them to work for them. I, I would assume that they did that, but once again, assumptions are not always. True, especially in this case where things seem to be so uh, unusual from the beginning. Another thing that I'll tell you is unusual is we were contacting the circuit attorney's office saying we want to come in and explain to you why this peeping Tom statute doesn't apply to two people who are engaged in a consensual uh, situation. And we're told, yeah, we'll get back to you. And, um, and then the indictment came down. They refused to even listen to our position that this is not a crime under these circumstances, which I'm 100% confident of, that at some point that's going to be determined. And um, that is just really strange to me. The um, circuit attorney said, well, you know, nobody in the history of, of St. Louis, no circuit attorney in the history of St. Louis has ever talked to a, a lawyer before they charge their, their client. And I... My dad was a circuit attorney in St. Louis, and I know how he ran that office. Um, I know uh, because when I was a U.S. attorney and an assistant U.S. attorney, he was always advising me when I asked him to. And, of course, you meet with lawyers on the other side. You do it constantly. You, you, it would be incredibly foolish not to. You want to be educated, especially if you're going to do something like this where you, you know, throw a monkey wrench into the entire state government and... Um, and potentially ruin someone on a case that should have never been brought. Yeah, you're indicting a sitting governor. I mean, you think, and, and that's, what I was, that's what I was about to ask you, because there was this insinuation somehow, I don't know whether it was uh, through Kim Gardner or through the office or just in the media, that somehow you guys wanting to meet with them was somehow unorthodox, but you're saying that it actually it's pretty common. It's what happens normally. It is totally standard operating procedure in a complicated uh, white-collar case like this is, when you consider all the ramifications of, her, of the conduct of, of charging this man for a three-year-old uh, tryst with consenting adults, you're just like, how could you not meet and find out what they're going to tell you? Well, we're saying this is not a crime. And then, well, we don't want to hear it's not a crime. We want to go ahead and indict. That is very, very unusual. Ed, is there a photo? I have no idea if they, if they have a photo or not. They, they have not shared any information with us at all. And, mm -hmm. and that's another unusual thing. I mean, they literally have not given us one bit of information. But we're going to get it. We're, we're filing motions. We filed motions with the court. We filed a motion to dismiss the case. And we have filed motions for discovery. And... Uh, our lawyers are going down there to uh, hopefully get some discovery. Was there a photo taken? I, I can't get into that. Um, it doesn't matter, I can tell you that. Uh, this charge has nothing to do 
with um, right. The, the, the actual charge itself has nothing to do with that. The only thing that matters here is that did she have a reasonable expectation of not being viewed naked? And I think the answer to that is pretty clear. Right. You understand that she that she went into somebody else's house and took her clothes off. So at the end of the of the question. That's all you need to know to know that there's no crime here because she could not have a reasonable expectation of not being viewed naked when you take your clothes off with someone else there. Right. That's and, the end of it. So you're talking about just the the, the law itself, and I guess in yes. term, and, and and that's all that matters now because for the most part, before the indictment, most people, most reasonable people, said we get it. This was some kind of affair. Uh, uh, the governor admitted to it. And most people just simply said, all right, let, let the governor, as he points out, uh, he will take the whatever is coming his way in terms of public opinion and voters and that kind of thing. And clearly exactly. the, the family is tackling this uh, themselves. And most people were just like, hey, forget it. So uh, can you comment uh, and I know this is an opinion thing, and you and you're dealing with facts. But do you think this is a political thing? That this is this is, that there's there are politics involved in in the in the pursuance of this indictment. Well, uh, the whole thing is just so strange. That's all I can tell you. Is my experience as a U.S. attorney, as an assistant U.S. attorney, running the Waco investigation for Senator Danforth. Uh, I have never seen anything like this. I've never seen a case handled like this. Uh, where all of the people, both of the people involved, uh, including Mrs. Greitens, have, have said, please, you know, we've dealt with this three years ago, and we're still dealing with it. She loves her husband and, and the governor and, um, and the lady that was involved have all said, please just give us privacy. I think that's what should have been done. This was a private matter. And... Um, the ex-husband and his lawyer have just generated so much negative publicity uh, with so many false statements being made. It's just, it's just grotesque. And uh, so people can draw their own conclusions, but um, he never should have been charged, I can tell you that for sure. One of those false statements was the interest of the FBI, which, uh, as you indicated, is non-existent in, in this whole matter. And, and that came out early, so uh, that, that was correct. baloney. Uh, then too. Yeah, that's totally correct. That was just thrown out there over and over again that the FBI is extremely interested in this and investigating, and I know for a fact that they are not, and you've never seen a word about them. No. And and, and, and it, most people are wondering, okay, so does this drag on, or how do you all, like when, you, when you're asking that this be dismissed, uh, how soon does it happen? I mean, how, how, what's the process here? Uh we need to get discovery from the circuit attorney's office before we can have a hearing on the motion to dismiss. Once we get discovery and take depositions, uh, we will call up the motion to dismiss and uh, take it from there. Well, and, and whoever is running the show in terms of the judge, I think there's, there's a compelling reason to make this quick. Uh, in terms of any kind of decision on dismissal, because right now uh, the wheels are rolling and the governor's enemies are sharpening their knives and ready to go. And there's a lot at stake for the, for the, for the state more than anything. I think there's a compelling reason to, for this to be happening fast. There's no doubt about it. He has a right to a speedy trial if it goes that far. And uh, as you say, there's a lot going on in this state and, and that's the governor of the state. He has a right to have a speedy trial just like everybody else. Ed Dowd, uh, listen, I, I, I've, I've said this before, uh, and I said this last week. Here's, here's a guy, Ed Dowd, who worked with Senator Danforth on the Waco investigation. He has been a U.S. attorney. The Dowd family has been an up-and-down, just absolutely buttoned-up, family that has served the state and his father as you know is circuit attorney uh judges all down the line and i I know this is a softball and i get it but uh, listen you wouldn't i mean your name you you have a your last name is dowd Uh, you you wouldn't put yourself out here if you truly didn't believe in what you say and 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 in the governor's innocence here no that's exactly right 
I 100% believe and know that he's innocent of what he's charged with. There's no doubt about it. Well, and the rest is stuff that we've already adjudicated in terms of the public square and uh, and the governor is more than willing to take whatever that is coming in that fashion. But this is this is a critical deal here. And Ed Dowd, I appreciate you coming on the air with us and uh, and talking to us about it. And we'll be in touch. I'm happy to, Jamie. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you. That's Ed Dowd. And again, folks, I mean, the the governor. A lot of you don't understand. Um, it, there's no amount of money that first of all that Ed Dowd even needs. By the way. <laughs> And that to to have somebody put themselves out on a limb like this, if they truly didn't believe that the governor is innocent as charged, and he the governor himself says he's not innocent when it comes to what happened with his family, what happened with the affair, he's already said that. So, uh, and and I believe that uh, this is absolutely necessary for them to get this thing done because already you're seeing on the post dispatch at down in jeff city starting impeachment hearings what are you gonna what, whatever happened to the presumption of innocence mm-hmm. how can you impeach yeah. somebody for when they're when they're just charged with a crime i mean it's it's unbelievable but they're down there because they all have their and they want they want to remove governor greitens and, and they want all the Beverly Hillbillies to move in down there and the governor's mansion and beyond. Because that's what the place, all these, all these hayseeds down there are now running amok. And they don't like the governor because he came in and he's draining the swamp down there. And they'll do anything to avoid that. We done. Yeah. <laughs> we gotta go. We gotta go.